With Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League coming soon, I figured there was going to be no better time in the next few years for me to do a Suicide Squad Grand Prix three Mondays in a row doing three different Suicide Squad focused videos. And since I'd actually considered doing a My Hero Academia Grand Prix, but figured I could put that off until Season 7 starts or something, I figured it'd be fun to take My Hero Academia characters and put them on the Suicide Squad. Also leave me some suggestions for what Suicide Squad characters you want to see turned into dragons for next Monday, and subscribe if you're new here and you want to make sure to see that, but also sit back, relax, and enjoy some more Task Force X. Let's go! Hit like! If you want, subscribe, if you feel like. But either way, enjoy the show. While Batman nowadays is known as the revered hero of Gotham and founding member of the Justice League, it is easy to forget that there was a time when he was regarded by many as a dangerous vigilante. Though even in those days, he did still have his admirers, old and young. Although not all of them would stay admirers. Keiko Takami never saw many heroes growing up in a small town a ways outside of Gotham. He knew they existed, but they weren't really on his radar. Until the day his mother took him into Gotham and bought him a seriously discounted Batman doll just to shut him up. You see, Keigo didn't have the best parents. In fact, it would almost be a stretch to call them his guardians at all. His dad was a low-rent supervillain, and his mother didn't go out on jobs with him, but actively helped him from home. Kago had been an accident, and his father many times considered giving him up for adoption or even just dumping him somewhere and leaving him, though luckily his mother always talked him off it. So he remained in their home, and they near constantly kept him locked up inside so that he couldn't squeal to anyone about what his dad did for money. Like that trip to Gotham, his mother would occasionally take him out, but it would rarely be for long, and that Batman doll was one of the few things his mother ever gave him. Though, his father would eventually give him something much, much more valuable, albeit unintentionally. You see, not fully realizing what he'd scooped on a raid of a LexCorp outpost, Keiko's dad had stolen a prototype wingsuit made from an alien material called Nth Metal. When he'd gotten it home, it was still encased in a large transparent tube with a high security lock system on it. Keiko's dad was rushing to get it off so he could ditch it in case it had a tracker on it, but when he finally got it open, the wings shot out and floated up into the middle of the room, vibrating in midair. His old man reached up to try and grab them, but the wings started darting around the room, smashing the table, knocking over lamps, and tearing up the walls. Kago couldn't help laughing at the sight as his parents scrambled to try and grab them, but soon the wings shot right down at the boy and stuck to his back. They suddenly shrunk and spread across his torso like a liquid metal shirt. His father freaked out and told the boy to take it off, but even as his father beat the boy and tried to forcibly pry it off, the metal wouldn't budge. Eventually, his dad gave up and just moved on to plans for other heists. Later, when his dad would be away, Kago would sneak out into the yard and see what his wings could do. With just a thought, he could shift them back into the shape of wings and even shoot the metal feathers off of them like daggers to then come back to him. Of course, he could also fly as well, and... Every day he considered just flying away from his parents, but couldn't bring himself to do it. His mother was still occasionally affectionate towards him. He even considered doing what Batman might do, using his odd gadget to apprehend his father and turn him into the police. Maybe then he and his mother could live a normal life. But before he had the chance, the Bat did it for him. He and his mother saw on the news one night that his dad had gotten taken down by Batman and was going to prison for multiple counts of armed robbery. While he'd never say it to his mother, Kago was deeply grateful to Batman for doing this and yearned to meet him one day to thank the Caped Crusader. And that day would, unfortunately, come eventually. Fearing the police may come after her for being an accomplice, Kago's mother took him away from their home and they went into hiding in Bloodhaven. There, they'd blow what little money they had quickly and end up on the streets, where Kago's mother would start scolding him for not using his abilities to steal them food and money. Kago knew his mother wasn't treating him well, but she was also still his mother, so eventually he decided to try doing just what she said. He started using his wings to fly through the nights and look out for places he could steal from, without going too big on his crimes. He didn't want to be a criminal, he just wanted to feed himself and his mother. But a winged teenager can't fly around a neighboring city to Gotham without eventually drawing attention. 
Midway through a robbery where he was using his wings to rip an ATM open, Batman swooped down on Kago and got him in a chokehold from behind. Instinctively, his wings thrust back and sliced through the bat's Kevlar to cut three gashes into his chest. Kago turned in a panic, and upon seeing the hero that had taken down his father, he tried to apologize and explain himself. But this wasn't in a time when Batman was a good listener. He hadn't yet gotten Dick Grayson as his first Robin and become more empathetic as a hero, so all he saw was a high-powered threat that he had to take down. Even with his nth metal helping him, the boy was thoroughly beaten and trounced by Batman, then handed over to the authorities. Completely disheartened by being beaten by a man he once thought of as his savior, Kago said nothing in any of his trials to get himself an easier sentence. He also never revealed anything about his mother to ensure that she couldn't get brought into the mix and possibly get in trouble herself. Nobody had been able to find a way to get the nth metal off of him, as few on Earth knew much about the Thanagarian material at that time. So, despite only being 17, he was tried as a metahuman adult and was sent to Belle Reve for 10 years. When he learned of the ability to reduce his prison sentence by joining Task Force X, Keiko developed a new goal. He'd use the squad as superhero training and get out of Belle Reve faster. Then, once free, use his wings to become a hero. A real hero. One that wasn't as cruel and careless as he saw Batman to be. Kago's early life may have been full of suffering, but, well, you wouldn't know it from his aloof and casual demeanor, he had every intent to spend the rest of his life using his new powers to abolish as much suffering as he could from the lives of others, not wanting anyone to go through the same kind of life that he'd already experienced. There have been many Green Lanterns of Earth over the years, but one stands out as a unique being among them. For he did not get his powers to manifest glowing green matter by receiving a lantern ring. Instead, Alan Scott gained his Green Lantern abilities through a mystical artifact called the Star Heart, created by the Guardians of the Universe, and because of this, his actual biology was affected long term. And unexpectedly, this enabled his abilities to be evolved and transferred to future generations. Scott was a founding member of the Justice Society of America, which would become a revered team of heroes that still exists to this day, though they do not have quite the popularity of the more public-facing Justice League. Scott no longer works as an active member of the team, but has amassed a vast fortune and has used this to help fund the team's future endeavors. He also had children, who gained powers as a result of his Starheart altered body. One of those was Jenny Lynn Hayden, or Jade, who had lantern-like powers and plant manipulation abilities she gained from her mother. She then had a daughter herself, Momo, who too also eventually gained abilities, though hers would end up far surpassing her mother's and grandfather's. Momo would gain normal lantern-like abilities at first by the time she was only 8 years old, but by high school they had rapidly developed to a point where her constructs could harden and materialize into real existing items that would remain in existence even without her concentration. She could literally create matter from nothing. While she was generally a very reserved young woman, it was hard for her to not express her immense excitement over her abilities and her yearning to use them as a part of the Justice Society someday. But with her abilities becoming public knowledge, something very unexpected would become her undoing. Bureaucracy. On a trial basis, she went on a few missions with the Justice Society and used her abilities to take down a few mid-level villains, and, in her wake, would often leave behind items she'd made in the process that people would scavenge then sell off. On top of that, when Momo would see people on the streets in need, she would often create gold coins or diamonds to give them so they could sell them and have some money to start new lives with. This was when her abilities were brought under scrutiny by government officials. She was soon approached and told that the US government would be putting significant caps on what she was legally allowed to produce. They said that heroes like her creating valuable items and handing them out could eventually escalate and lead to the toppling of the world economy. She argued that she was just one person trying to help people, not an army of matter creators with the power to ruin the world. Plus, she said that if the government could approve the printing of massive amounts of new money and then not use any of that to help homeless people and those in need, then it was her duty to do just that. But 
Her arguments fell on deaf ears, and beyond limiting her creation of things like diamonds and gold, the limitations they were trying to put on her would hinder her from creating the majority of useful items she needed to be a hero. She'd go from being an incredible asset to being hardly useful at all. Still, the government lawyers were far better than anything even her wealthy family could afford, and the laws were put in place, strictly limiting what heroes with matter creation abilities could make. Of course, Green Lanterns were still fine because their constructs disappeared after they used them, but Momo was left extremely disheartened. Her dreams of becoming a hero were essentially shattered. Or at least becoming a hero in the public eye, anyway. Amanda Waller worked closely with the Justice Society through her organization known as Argus, a secretive department that also helped her run and organize, you guessed it, the Suicide Squad. Waller approached Momo and informed the girl of Task Force X and its covert missions. She said that since it was a team of villains that couldn't always be relied on to follow orders, even under the threat of having their heads popped off with a remote-triggered explosion, Waller could use a good hero leading the team on more high-priority missions. She even said she'd look the other way and let Momo use her powers as she pleased, and that they had a guy who could clean up anything she left behind. Momo was still deeply frustrated by the laws limiting her, and wanted to try fighting them in the future, but for now, working for a covert team was at least some way she could live out a version of her heroic dreams. And so, despite not being a Belle Reve prisoner like most of her quote-unquote teammates, Momo became a leader and off-site warden for the Suicide Squad. Izuku Midoriya grew up in a time when metahumans were becoming more and more common. It seemed every day a new hero or villain was emerging to join the ranks of, or fight against, the Teen Titans or Justice League. But no matter how many new heroes emerged, there was none that inspired Midoriya more than the strongest hero of all, who fought crime with a smile and brought hope to all he helped. Superman. Midoriya wanted to be just like him one day, a great and revered hero. The only problem was Midoriya had no superpowers. Living in Metropolis with his mother, Midoriya had once even been able to speak to Superman, as he'd been on the scene of a crime in progress and been there as the Man of Steel thwarted it. Against his mother's wishes, he'd run up to Superman and asked him if there was any way he could get powers so he could be a hero too. Superman tried to inspire the boy as he let him down easy, saying there was no safe way for him to acquire powers, but that he could help people in other ways. He could become a firefighter or teacher or volunteer in his community to help those in need. It was all good advice, but not what Midoriya was looking for. Years later, when he was near the end of high school, Metropolis was attacked by an invasion of parademons sent by the ruler of Apocalypse, Darkseid. The entire Justice League came to help save the city and push the threat back to the hell world they'd come from, but to do that they needed to find the mother box somewhere in the city that had opened a boom tube portal to the tyrant's homeworld. Midoriya had been walking home from school when the whole thing had begun, and he'd seen the first swarms of parademons surging up from the subway systems. He'd managed to hide and not get grabbed or killed, but with no more parademons emerging from the closest tunnel, he thought he may be able to find where they'd come from himself. He'd researched everything about Superman and his villains and the Justice League, so he knew there had to be a portal through which the demons were coming. He thought maybe if he helped end this attack, someone in the Justice League may reward him with tech or abilities that could let him become a hero too. So, recklessly, he went down into the subway tunnels and began his search, hiding from the occasional parademon. It didn't take him long to hear a thundering voice barking orders at Parademons before he found a mother box, an open boom tube, and a being that Midoriya was pretty sure was Desaad, the head torturer of Darkseid. Midoriya should have turned around then and there and seen if he could find anyone to tell, but he convinced himself that there was no time. Really, subconsciously, just being so desperate to be the hero himself that he grabbed a couple large pieces of debris off the ground and ran at the mother box before Desaad could turn around and see him. He swung both pieces, hoping on some slight chance he could damage the box, but before he could even hit it, he was sucked up into the boom tube and spat out on the other side, at the doorway to Darkseid's palace on Apocalypse. 
Darkseid himself was there, along with Granny Goodness, Steppenwolf, and other beings Midoriya had never seen. They looked at the boy curiously. He stared back for a moment, then, in blind determination and the yearning to be a hero, he ran at Darkseid and hurled one of the pieces of debris right at his face. The towering tyrant didn't even flinch as the rock bounced off him. The others all laughed, and as Midoriya got close, Darkseid grabbed the boy around the waist and lifted him into the air, asking, What did a feeble urchin like you hope to accomplish here, boy? Feeling his body being crushed, he yelled that even with no powers and almost no chance he could do anything to help, he had to try anything he could to stop Darkseid, no matter the cost. That it's exactly what Superman would do. He said if he couldn't live like Superman, at least he'd die fighting a way the Man of Steel could be proud of. But Darkseid had other plans. Upon hearing the name of the being who'd thwarted Darkseid's plans all too many times being praised by this boy, an idea came to him. He summoned another mother box, and without Midoriya knowing what the villain was doing, he suddenly felt an excruciating surge of pain firing through his body. The last thing he heard before blacking out was Darkseid saying, Give the Kryptonian my greetings. When Midoriya came to, he was no longer in pain. In fact, his body felt kind of incredible. Though, when he realized he was back in Metropolis being carried by a parademon, he panicked. Instinctively, he swung his hand up and smacked the demon, and astoundingly, it exploded upwards from the hit, so fast that its arms ripped off. Midoriya fell a hundred feet and was sure he was about to become a pancake, but he crashed into the street below and felt totally fine. He got up and looked at his body, seeing that his skin had started to become flaky and stony, almost like Darkseid. His attention on himself was pulled away as he heard people screaming around him, with many still trying to get out of Metropolis and away from the parademons. Midoriya stared at the demons in rage and a desire to destroy them. And just with that thought, a set of crimson, bending, and twisting beams came out of his eyes and exploded eight different parademons in one shot. Midoriya knew exactly what that was, an Omega Beam, the exact kind of attack Darkseid was known to use. He didn't take any time to wonder why the Fiend had done it, but Darkseid had given the boy his own powers. Of course, as Midoriya kept using the powers, an ability like the Omega Beam quickly drew the eyes of Superman and the Justice League, and many of them descended on Midoriya's position. They cautiously circled around him, and he tried to explain what exactly had happened, and say that something must have gone wrong with Darkseid's plan, and Midoriya had gotten away with Darkseid's powers and could now help the League but none of them were convinced. Superman tried to calmly explain that they couldn't risk him using these powers more, that Darkseid must be using him for something, and they had to find out what. But this just infuriated Midoriya. He finally had the thing he'd always wanted, he had superpowers that may even rival Superman's, and the League was going to make him stop using them? A rage boiled up inside him that Midoriya couldn't consciously see at the time, was not normal for him. With the briefest thought, the Omega Beams burst from his eyes again and shot right at Superman, striking him in the chest, then bouncing away to go for other members of the League. The rage overtook him, and while his powers were vast, they were also more than his body could handle, and upon landing some incredibly powerful blows on Green Lantern and Wonder Woman, Midoriya shattered his own limbs under the weight of his new powers before finally being restrained. The last thing he yelled at Superman as Green Lantern flew him towards the gateway back to the Justice League's watchtower was, I just wanted to be like you. It broke the Man of Steel's spirit, and perhaps that's exactly what Darkseid had wanted, but the rest of the League still managed to thwart the tyrant's latest assault on Earth. Midoriya was studied in the watchtower, but eventually they didn't know what to do with him, so they just tried letting him go back to his life but still asserting that he not use these powers until they knew why Darkseid had given them to him. Of course, he didn't listen. He started using the powers to stop crimes in Metropolis, often causing a lot of property damage with his limited control of the abilities, and Superman was forced to come and stop him. He tried at first again to just calmly talk the boy down, but with the rage of Darkseid swaying him, Midoriya attacked Superman, and once again, the heartbroken hero was forced to take Midoriya down. He was locked away in Belle Reve, and, well, 
Amanda Waller wasn't about to let an asset as powerful as him just rot away without using him to her advantage. Few know the origins of the thing that resides in the Louisiana swamps, but fewer still know that before he became the creature that he is today, Swamp Thing had a daughter. Alec Holland was a scientist who, with the help of his loving wife Linda, had created a bio-restorative formula that would help solve food shortages around the globe. Unfortunately, a man named Nathan Everly, running a criminal organization called the Conclave, learned of this experiment and wanted it for himself. Sending his thugs after Alec resulted in his lab exploding, dousing Alec in the very chemicals he'd created, igniting him in flames, and forcing him to jump into the swamp, where he was believed to have died at the time, though his consciousness would later prove to have lived on in the form of the protector of the green, Swamp Thing. Linda, however, was forced to flee the facility and managed to escape the Conclave goons, but was more devastated than Alec could have known, as she'd planned that night on telling him she was pregnant with his child. Not long after, Linda was believed to have been killed by a goon of the Conclave, sent to silence her. But when she begged for her life, saying she was pregnant, the thug took pity on her and told his employer he'd killed her while telling her to get out of town and change her name. She took on her grandmother's family name, Ibarra. She'd end up giving birth to a girl that she named Shiozaki, after that same grandmother, and Shiozaki would grow up to be very calm and quiet as a child, but with deep, inherent spiritual leanings. Her mother would take her to church on Sundays, but often it would be on Shiozaki's own request, as she felt naturally drawn to these beliefs. She'd pray for her mother every night, as it was clear to her from a young age that her mother was not happy, and she'd eventually come to believe that it was because of what had happened to her father. When Shiozaki would look into the event and the swamps herself, she'd learn of the being that had emerged from them just after her father's death, and she believed that the soul of her father may be in this creature. But her mother didn't want to hear it. One day, when she was old enough to drive herself, Shiozaki would go to the very swamp where she'd lost her father before even being born, and she'd pray. She'd pray out loud for God to guide the creature to her so she could give her mother any kind of closure that may help her move on, or accept that her husband was still alive in another form. She stayed there for hours, continuously praying, in full faith that her prayers would be answered in some way. But as Shiozaki was all too aware, sometimes God works in mysterious ways. Some goons from the still active criminal organization, the Conclave, happened to come by this girl while they were out trying to track down the Swamp Thing with a new method to try and kill it. They heard her praying for her father, Alec Holland, to come before her. Like Shiozaki, the head of the Conclave had come to suspect that Holland was the Swamp Thing, so his name had been kicked around plenty, and these goons recognized it. They called their boss to confirm they had the right name, and he emphatically told them to bring this girl to him alive. But one of the goons got a bit overzealous. He figured if this girl was the daughter of Swamp Thing, then maybe they could use her to lure out the beast. They grabbed the girl out of her prayer and held a knife to her throat, calling out to Holland, and soon enough, that did finally garner a response. Vines emerged from the ground all around the goons and started winding up their legs. They told Swamp Thing to call him off or they'd kill her, but the vines quickly yanked the two men down and dragged them into the swamp. Unfortunately, the man with the knife had a firm grip on Shiozaki and pulled her down too, and slit her throat as they fell. She too was dragged into the swamp, choking on blood and then the marshy waters, when she suddenly felt a warm, soothing hand on her throat. All the pain faded from her and she heard a voice say, Take a part of me, protect your mother. She awoke later on the shore, her clothing still soaked and her hair a very different texture. Her once black locks had been transformed into vines. With just a thought, they'd move where she wanted, and even grow at rapid lengths, or could burrow into the ground to burst up elsewhere. She thought back to the voice she'd heard and realized God had answered her prayers. She'd found her father, and he'd given her more than she could have hoped for. And she would need these abilities very soon. She returned home and told her mother what had happened, and that her father's soul was still in that swamp. 
and as she told the story, her vines draped over her mother's shoulders and seemed to send to her the very feeling of her lost husband's embrace. She finally was able to accept that he was still alive in the swamp, using his powers to protect people. But now, Shiozaki would have to do the same. The Conclave had tracked her down after they found their goons dead, and were outraged to see that Linda was still alive. They raided their house, only for Shiozaki to embrace her new abilities. Being a believer that only God may determine who lives and dies, Shiozaki ensured that as she used her abilities to fend off the Conclave, she did not kill a single one of them. But that didn't stop them from pinning the deaths of their two goons in the swamp on her, after realizing it was the only way to get her away from her mother. With plenty of pull with corrupt cops and people in the justice system, the Conclave managed to get Shiozaki put away for metahuman manslaughter, and with her out of the way, they could finally either finish off Linda, as they thought they'd done years ago, or possibly use her as a tool against Swamp Thing. Either way, Shiozaki needed to get out of prison as fast as possible, to help protect her mother and help her reunite with her father. That's right, she needed to reduce her Bell Reeve prison sentence, so take a wild guess at what team she decided to join. If you enjoyed this, I highly recommend checking out my recent Goofy Batman Villains Rebooted onto the Suicide Squad episode. It's a very fun video in my opinion, but you might also like my My Hero Academia Characters as Demons video. And I have tons of other My Hero Academia and Suicide Squad stuff on here. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note, and the thought I want to leave people with today is a message from Adlerian Psychology that I heard recently in the book The Courage to Be Disliked. And the quote itself is, The courage to be happy includes the courage to be disliked. The only way you could ever make everybody like you is by never actually being your true self. Don't go out of your way to be unlikable, but be who you are, say what you feel, in as kind and honest way as you can, and know that while there will be plenty of people that don't like you for it, it will also help you find the people that do like you for your true self and help you to have a much better relationship with yourself. I hope that's inspiring, I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next episode on Friday. Goodbye.